Thank you very much, Isabella, for the invitation, uh, for the introduction, and thanks the organizers for inviting me. And um, if I may have the chance to uh, steer off the topic a little bit in the beginning and take up a couple of points which I heard yesterday and today, it will, will not take long because I do not want to, uh, to overstretch my time. Um, <clears throat> what was missing today and yesterday is actually the historical genesis. We are 30 years uh, apart from a game-changing element or moment in European and international conditions and, and, and situations, namely the fall of the Berlin Wall, with all the aftershocks which we experienced. <clears throat> the fall of the Berlin Wall on the 9th of November ended the division of Europe, otherwise we wouldn't be here, and ended and, and, and started the unification process of Germany. The unification process of Germany one year later was only possible because there was a window of opportunity in the Soviet Union which probably lasted only for a year. It was over in August 1991. And there were of course processes who led to this kind of development which started already in the 70s of the last century, 1970s of the last century, the final act of Helsinki, which was then codified and enhanced in the Charter of Paris of November 1990. And this time period, not the 70s so much, and not the Reagan period in the 80s, but let's say the end of, or the dawning period of Gorbachev's uh, project of Glasnost and Perestroika and uh, when he got a majority position within the Politburo of the CPSS uh, in, 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 in Moscow and um, the Paris Charter maybe two years later up to 1992 where the golden age of stability, peace and prosperity in Europe. We all profited from this and we are still profiting to a certain degree. Afterwards, the situation changed totally. And I don't believe for one second if Gorbachev would have known what was going to happen in the 90s with the eastward movement and extension of NATO, that un the German unification would have been possible, or, you, or the peaceful mass demonstrations which erupted in the GDR would, ha would not have been met by physical military means because the East German government was ready to use tanks. The Chinese experience was possible as well. So this is one remark and I think we should look a little bit at this situation or keep it in mind as a starting point for our discussions of what will bring the future. The second point, and here I'm very, very cautious. Ferenc and I, we were together in Berkeley in the beginning of the 80s. I have had the chance to meet one of the most influential and thoughtful philosophers of that particular time, belonging to the Frankfurtian school, Leo Löwenthal. And I always ask Löwenthal, why didn't you do anything against the rise of fascism in the 30s? And he said, we couldn't do anything. It was like a wave, like a tsunami, not only in Germany, but in the whole of Europe. We were helpless. We couldn't do anything. So this is one element we have to consider. This kind of fascism will never repeat itself. Second point is, <clears throat> today you talked about the rising anti-Semitism in Germany. I think it is not rising, it was always there. It comes up. Because Germany was, to quote, Vladislav Zurkov, not a sovereign democracy. It was a managed democracy, monitoring by allies. And with unification, started the process in Germany to find an identity, 
because both identities in the East and the West did not match. And they don't even match after 30 years. And then in this, in this kind of searching process, suddenly the specters of the past came up. So anti-Semitism in, 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 in Germany is not different from the one in France and Britain or in Hungary or in Poland or what they have. It is, it is an element of the society. There are always two to five percent crazy nationalists or racists or whatever kind of uh, sections in a society, you have to live with them. So, and the worst thing, and this is, was as well what Leo Löwenthal in Berkeley told me is, do not create artificial protective means around identities. Because he, he, he used the term Schutzjude. I don't know how to translate it into protective uh, Jew or something like this. If you do this, then you're doing just the... Uh, the protected Jew. You're doing just the, 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 uh, um, the work of the anti-Semitic... Uh, and, 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 and the forces, because you're taking an ethnic, religious identity out of the context of the society, and you're creating artificial barriers around. And this will be an element of hate. And unfortunately, when the Jewish international community is acting in this way, that I'm very, I'm very sure um, the opposite will happen. Okay, let's go back to what I want to talk about. We have Andrei Kordunov with us. Andrei Kordunov is an old friend and one of the best experts among the uh, expert community of Russia. And um, he provoked me uh, to, to think about uh, the relationship between multipolarity and multilateralism in some of the, his blogs and, 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 and presentations. And I took up the challenge and I agree partly with him and I partly disagree to a certain degree with him because for, for Andre, and he can respond of course and he should respond if he, like to, if he likes to, for him multipolarity is a kind of a um, regime or an order which is um, based on historical conditions which are not with us anymore. And uh, according to him, if I understood him correctly, uh, multipolarity will vanish from the, as, as an order scheme as the unipolar world vanished or the bipolar world vanished. This may be, this may be true, but, but uh, given these remarks, we saw a kind of a rebirth of the multipolar uh, concepts shortly after the demise or the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91. And um, uh, the rebirth was echoed in Western European uh, circles, expert circles and political circles as well. It was never echoed in the United States. Because in the United States during the 90s, even up to the Obama administration, do and did and do believe in supremacy. They are the hegemon. And the hegemon cannot share power. And that's the case. So multipolarity as a concept never penetrated the expert world of the United States. It was in a cautious way embraced and announced um, in a document which was um, in a series of documents which were issued since 2009. The, which are concerned with the um, megatrends and the game changers and the prospects of development of uh, the international uh, state system by the NRC, the National Intelligence Council. National, National Intelligence Council, and I can only um, advise you, and um, if you are interested in these issues, um, is one of the um, uh, power blocks of expert knowledge because it does not only do its own research, but it reaches out to all the think tanks in the United States or the Anglo-Saxon world and even the West European world and tries to bring in their comments, their views, their uh, prospective um, uh, prognosis of what is going to be happen. And there are a couple of, of uh, documents being um, uh, written and brought out 
um, uh, in 2009, 2012, 2017. And these kind of documents are not the prescri prescription of the future, and they do not really um, give recommendations to the presidential administration what to do, but they, um, they uh, um, construct the framework what may happen and what kind of challenges are coming. And these documents you can access freely on the internet. Yeah? And the, for the first time in 2009, in one of these documents of the future of um, the international system in 2035, multipolarity was mentioned as a, pot a potential position the, the United States administration has to address. At the same time, and continuously since 2009, since the beginning of the Obama administration up to today, uh, the NRC always said the hegemony of the United States as a global leader is not tenable for the future. The United States hegemony is going to be weakened and the hegemony of the United States needs to be, let's say, reduced but reduced in a way that they have to share their interests, their notions, their concepts with partners. The search for partnering was on. And the search for partnering meant burden sharing. So if you cannot have your, uh, your uh, 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 supremacy anymore established by your own resources, you need, of course, the European allies. You need, of course, the Asian allies. And they should not only give lip service to transatlantic community ideas or to the Asian Pacific and um, 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 peace area or whatever, uh, but they should pay. And by paying, you become an element of the club and you strengthen, of course, the block structures which exist in one of the probably more foresighted um, American um, experts who is wrongly stated and cited always over his famous book Clash of Civilization. I think one of the other books which appeared in 2003, the choice is much more important, especially for the European scenery and discussion. He said, we have to preserve at all means the Euro-Atlantic bloc. There should not be any deviation from it. There were deviations in 2003, with Germany not joining the Iraq war, France as well not. So, but the bloc should stay in, 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 um, to, together and be um, used as a kind of a reassurance and guarantee for the American power position in the international, in the international environment. Multipolarity, if we talk about multipolarity, and especially um, in the expert circles, um, we always refer to the golden age of multipolarity, and the golden age of multipolarity is of course the 19th century. 19th century was structured, it was, first of all it was a European century. China was not existent, the United States were far away, Africa was a colony, South America didn't play a role. So multipolarity and the world power was centered in Europe. And there were five huge actors or powers who created the multipolar system after the Treaty of, of Vienna. Tsarist Russia, Habsburg, Fr France was invited despite Napoleon. Prussia and England. And this kind of multipolarity was based on the international relations principle which is still relevant today, balance. You have to be balanced to be equal. And to be equal means you should be relatively equal, of course, with minor plus and minuses, in military terms, economic terms, you have to share the same normative uh, beliefs, values, 
and um, or you have to be ruled by similar elite structures. This was all given in the 19th century. It was a rule of the feudal aristocracy, of monarchies, which were interlinked by family ties, even the British and the, and the, the German and the Russian one. Yeah? And it worked for nearly 100 years. And the interesting fact is, um, and they were economically and politically and militarily relatively equal. So multipolarity as a principle of a balanced, non-aggressive, cooperative system of ruling huge chunks of, uh, of a continent or even parts of the world can work. And forgive me if I um, make a very um, irrational step into the uh, uh, present past. This kind of multipolar system existed as well under different conditions. Uh, at the end of the Gorbachev and uh, uh, Bush in a period when the United Nations Security Council was functioning. We have had a mandated legal war against Iraq, the first one, because of international violation, uh, 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 violation of international law and occupation of Kuwait. It was mandated. There was no critique. And the Russians performed so together with the Americans and with the, uh, with, with the European members in the, in the United uh, uh, Nations uh, Security Council. So this was a kind of a glimpse of a golden possible age as well, that the, that the way that the world can move out of the um, uh, death weight or dead weight of uh, bipolarity and two camp thinking, which ruled basically the world from 49 up to um, uh, 91. And there were incredible hopes connected to a continuation of this kind of situation. But of course, the United States never gave up during the 90s the idea of supremacy. So NATO, NATO extension was a death blow to any multipolar approach at that particular time. And it was, of course, as well, a death blow to emancipation of the um, emerging European new integration uh, process, which was based on Maastricht in 1992, but has had, of course, its um, 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 an, an early um, trends. And uh, Europe basically did not follow through and um, um, supported the um, an, an NATO extension to the east and by and, and supporting the NATO extension to the east of course the multipolar element was not any more realistic. Russia couldn't do anything because it was not only on its knees maybe on its belly economically destroyed politically not taken seriously not invited to join the western institutions the whole Soviet Empire, Warsaw Pact and Comic Con, was broken, completely broken. All the in in institutions and the in orientations of Russia toward the Third World or developing countries in Africa and Asia and South America were down. There was no money, no resources. There was only political instability and basically chaos in Russia for 10 years, from 91 to 99 or to 2000 or whatever. So Russia, as a, as, as a supporter of a potential multipolar world, and I think that Gorbachev was very close of embracing such a concept, was not a promoter of the idea as well. And the uh, West European uh, countries in, in NATO, in, oh, okay, <laughs> uh, in NATO and in the European Union, um, of course, they embraced the idea of multipolarity, but uh, they were basically um, linked to the Euro-Atlantic um, um, orientation and therefore they do not promote it. A newcomer to the idea of um, multipolarity was of course China. 
from the middle of the 90s onwards, and strongly, uh, more stronger than in the, uh, in the first, two, deca uh, 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 first uh, two decades of the new millennium. But China has had a different concept as Russia in the 90s or before, or as the Europeans. The, the Russian concept of, um, of multipolarity, which was then aired in the middle of the 90s, very tacitly, but without any chance of being real, uh, realized, was by Yevgeny Primakov, when he was foreign minister of um, uh, post-Soviet Russia. Primakov dreamt about an alliance between China, India, and Russia. And the element or the objective of the alliance was, of course, to keep the Americans at bay, to control them, and they should not interfere. It was not realistic, but was, it is a nice shining city on the hill. It is now being probably realized, can I, another three minutes? Can, uh, probably realized because this kind of multipolarity orientation as a, cr as a crucial element or structural element of Russian foreign policy never really went away. But they were very cautious about really promoting and pushing it. But the new the development which we do see are not the realization of the Primakov plan or idea or concept of India, Russia, and, and, and China, but it's much more wider. What we are seeing emerging in this kind of um, territorial stretch of, the, of our globe is the concept of Greater Eurasia. And Greater Eurasia is China, India, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, Turkey. There are no institutions. There's not, not even a kind of a common consensus about domestic national interests or objectives. But they are united by one idea, to keep the US out. This, this brings them together. If this idea can flourish and develop in, in, into a kind of a, let's say, interest community in the geopolitical or geoeconomic sense, we don't know. But the forces which are unleashed are there. And um, on, of course, in this kind um, of community, Russia and China are playing a very specific role. Um, China, let's say, the Chinese position on multipolarity is a kind of a mixed bag between tra the traditional old 19th century <coughs> orientation and the um, situation which we have had between 1949 and um, the decline or the demise of the Soviet Union by polarity. So they mix both elements. So the new polarity is totally different from the one of the 19th century because the actors are not equal, neither in economic, political, or, or military resources. But they are, but they have to integrate elements of the old systems which will not go away and which will not evaporate in the foreseeable future. This is, of course, uh, the bipolar elements of nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence for them is basically a kind of a safe and a life-saving guarantee for not being attacked. And this is followed by other countries as well. So, last sentence. I do not share the belief that multipolarity and multilateralism, and I think that multilateralism at the moment is much more important than multipolarity, that they are basically enemies or foes. They are kind of some, some uh, Siamese twins. There will be no multipolarity without, at least not in, an, in, in a cooperative way, if, not, if there is not a coming together and bridging of differences between the um, um, actors who are shaping the development and the design of the new world order in, 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 the, in, in the near future. So multipolarity is much more an expression of the complex situation our states, our societies have been in or are in and will probably develop along this path even further in the future. So 
It is based on interconnectivity, of interdependence in economic and political and cultural terms. It is based on very different um, uh, levels of um, uh, military might. It is based on um, the uh, um, uh, concept, especially shared by our European um, uh, friends and members in NATO as well as in the European Union, never to never uh, go to war again. So that means we have to negotiate and to increase the dialogue even among opposing partners to keep peace and stability in our territory. And so these kind of um, um, developments are basically driven by, not only by political will or by political consciousness, but they are driven as well by the industrial technological development we are facing and we are in at the moment. There is no way anymore of creating static, centralized structures. And I agree totally with my um, um, German friend from, and colleague from, from Munich. Decentralization is the name of the future. Uh, but decentralization needs to be constructed around institutions, needs to be based on a common understanding of um, consensus in crucial terms, and these consensus cannot be primarily value-driven. Ve I'm sorry, last sentence. <laughs> <laughs> We have to come back to an interest-driven economic and political understanding of each other on values, as we experience it in Germany especially, have created the differences and the separation and destroyed the consensus which existed since the demise or the collapse of the Soviet Union up to the end of the second decade in the new millennium. Thank you very much for your